Welcome to Worship at Bethel, originating from Bethel Lutheran Church in downtown Madison, Wisconsin, and broadcast throughout the state and across the internet. A member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Rich in tradition with nearly 160 years of ministry. Rich in worship with services in English, Spanish, and Nepali. Bethel Lutheran Church is a vibrant urban congregation. Living lives of worship and praise. Loving one another through faith, community, and care. Serving all and God's world. And thriving by faithful stewardship. Join us for worship at Bethel. He is risen. Well, welcome to worship on this seventh and final Sunday in the season of Easter. And also, happy Mother's Day uh, to all. We will mark Mother's Day near the end of worship with a, a blessing prayer for all, uh, all women uh, who are here and all women in our memories. So that'll come up near the end of worship. We also want to welcome all those who are worshiping today on television or through the internet. We're so glad you've chosen to make worship at Bethel part of your day. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God. For in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Make us love, love what you command, command and, and desire, desire what you promise, that amid all the changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true, where true joy is found. found. Your, Your Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Revelation. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the roots and the descendant of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let everyone who hears say, come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you. This is a section from the 17th chapter of John. It comes at the conclusion of the Last Supper as narrated by John. Jesus has washed the disciples' feet 
They have shared the meal and now Jesus prays. This is the conclusion of this prayer. And when Jesus finishes this prayer, they go to the garden where Jesus will be arrested. So Jesus is praying and prays, I ask not only on behalf of these disciples, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you. Please be seated. He is risen. Well, I read the other day that the failure rate of businesses who, who merge and try to become one is 83%. With an 83% failure rate, you wonder why any two businesses would ever try to become one. But everyone thinks they could be part of the 17% who makes it. Think of Disney and Pixar. They're certainly part of that 17% of businesses, right? They formally merged in 2006, and I'm sure you thought they had been together long before then. But both Disney animated movies and Pixar films have had incredible success since their merger. Think of the Disney film Frozen from a few years ago. It is now the fifth highest grossing film of all time. Not of animated films, of all films. And last year, Pixar's Inside Out was the fourth largest grossing film of 2015. They're part of that 17%. But the business pages of old newspapers are full of the 83%, the mergers that have failed, and some in amazing fashion. Back in 2000, almost all of us who got on the internet got on by a home phone modem. Remember that squeaky sound that used to be? Well, AOL was really the king of dial-up internet service. And so AOL and Time Warner, they merged in 2001. In 2003, they reported a $100 billion loss. It was a dial-up merger in a DSL world. Now the fundamental premise of any merger is that the merging entities will be more valuable together than they are separately. They hope to take their cue from that Latin phrase found on the back side of the U.S. symbol, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Coming together, becoming one, is supposed to make the two better as one. Yet, as I said, 83% of mergers fail. Overall, businesses and people aren't very good at becoming one. Our gospel text today is from that 17th chapter of John. This entire chapter is often called Jesus' high priestly prayer. And every year on the seventh Sunday of Easter, our text comes from this 17th chapter of John. In this prayer, we listen to Jesus' heart. Jesus' heart, as he articulates his desires for, as he says, his, his followers, those in the room and those followers who will believe in him because of them. That is, you and me. Jesus is praying for us here and for all of Jesus' followers. He prays that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. And did you hear why it is so important to Jesus that we be one? Jesus goes on to say, so that 
the world may believe. All of this oneness will be lived out in love. Jesus concludes this prayer by praying, the love with which you have loved me, may it be in them and I in them. But sadly, maybe the single item by which the followers of Jesus have failed the most spectacularly is to live in this prayerful desire of Jesus to be one. E pluribus unum. That out of the many, we would become one. I think the church would be ecstatic with a 17% success rate of becoming one. But I think our failure rate is much, much worse than any Wall Street merger and acquisition. I've been thinking about this text for some time now, this call to be one. And, and I came up, that's why this idea of e pluribus unum, the motto of our country, it sets a lofty goal, e pluribus unum. And whether you think of the many as many colonies or many states coming together to become one nation, or on a grander scale, you think of, you know, all of these many peoples and many races and many cultures and many religions and differences of every sort coming together to become one nation on either account. As a nation, we have not lived up to this rather aspirational motto. States don't come together very often and peoples of those states don't come together. In our own state of Wisconsin, it seems that we're always reminded of what separates one another rather than what might unite us. We are divided by small town and rural values versus city and urban values, by upstate and downstate. We're divided by government is what pulls us together to, to find solution versus government is the source of our problems. We're divided by Dems and Republicans we're divided by wealth and by race. We're divided by those who have been here a long time and those who have just arrived. Rarely do we as Americans live up to the motto of e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And when we look at the church, either church universal or church in terms of our own congregation like here at Bethel, we can find seemingly an endless list of things that divide and separate us rather than coming together as one as Jesus prays. Maybe it is as seminary professor, seminary president Rick Barger points out, maybe we're so far away from being one as Jesus prays because as the church we've become confused about our identity and our calling and our purpose. In our postmodern market-driven culture, congregations often are perceived as, and I quote, some sort of spiritual version of community recreation centers, offering up programs and experiences to meet people's needs. And if congregations mistakenly think our primary purpose is to meet people's needs and wants, we have tragically missed the purpose and identity of the community of faith to which Jesus calls us, invites us. You and I both know that there are many reasons why the followers of Jesus are not one. It's almost comical how we're not one. And when you read the book of Acts, the history of the early church, right after the ascension of Jesus, how the church tried and failed to come together as one, you can see that at the very church, there were always arguments. Arguments about who should be part of the community and who should not be part of the community. And while the category of people has changed over centuries, the conversation has not. The early church, the question was whether or not males who were circumcised or not could be part of the community. Now congregations ask different sort of questions about who's included or who is excluded. Should we welcome members of the LGBTQ community? Should we welcome folks who are registered sex offenders? Should we welcome those people who are not like us? Who to welcome? Who, to whom should the love of God for all people be proclaimed? So it sadly has stayed for centuries. The church often becomes a gathering of like-minded people. 
rather than e pluribus unum, out of many one. The first congregation I served was in San Luis Obispo, California. It was a smallish community, uh, typically had one flavor of every denomination. Uh, one of those spiritual communities there was the Unity Church. And while there was one ELCA Lutheran Church and one Missouri Synod Church and one United Methodist Church and one Episcopal and Presbyterian and, Meth- and so on, there were two Unity Churches in San Luis Obispo. Why? Because the Unity Church split into two. That's why. Yep. Now, we really shouldn't find it humorous because there's at least 52 different Lutheran denominations in the United States. 52. We Lutherans have come together and split time and time again for centuries now. And there's estimates that there are about nine thousand different Protestant denominations on the planet. And those who call themselves Catholic, which means universal after all, there are about 280 different collection of Jesus followers who hang the title Catholic as their moniker. And you thought there was only the Roman Catholic brand of Catholic. No, there's 279 other ones. Instead of being one out of many, instead of truly being e pluribus unum, we have turned it around so that we are many out of the one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism has been usurped by my Lord, my faith, my baptism. And this really isn't surprising. We all like to get our own way. We're picky about what we eat. We drive different cars because we like different things. We listen to different music, we watch different TV shows and movies, we read different books. Our houses are all designed differently. We like to have things that suit our tastes, our style, our liking. And church is but one more place where we just simply want what we like. And quite frankly, pastors and staff are no different than anyone else on this score. So, of course, we have multiple times of worship in multiple styles with different music in different places in different languages. And how are we to be one body when even within a single congregation there are constantly things to pull us apart? So let's listen to Jesus again. Let's go back to the beginning with Jesus. I ask, Jesus prays, that they may all be one so that the world may believe you sent me. I ask that they may be one, so that the world may believe you sent me. I and them and you and me, that they may be one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So do you hear what Jesus is praying about? The oneness of which Jesus prays about is not for our sake. The oneness that Jesus asks us to be a part of isn't about us. It's not so that we can feel good about being one. Jesus prays for us to be one for our witness for the sake of the world. So that our mission to proclaim Christ and Christ crucified might be strengthened. It is for the sake of the world. It's for the sake of the neighbor that Jesus prays that we be one. Jesus prays that we might be one so that the world might know how much Jesus loves them. So, pastor, how do we do that? How can we be one out of many? Because I can live with oneness if somebody else doesn't get what they want. But I'm not thrilled when I don't get what I want. Not thrilled when a preacher says things I don't like, when we sing hymns I don't know, when there are so many people I don't recognize. Pastor, how can we be one? Well, you want the short answer? Love. Love. Being loved. Knowing that you are loved is the only way we ever put someone else in front of us. Paul in Philippians 2 talks about having the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ when we've experienced the love and grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ deep in our lives. 
when we've experienced this depth of love, suddenly the need to be right, the need to have our own way, all the other self-centered views of the world really aren't important anymore when we put things through the lens of love. When we truly love because we know we are loved. Let me tell you a story of this. On the last Christmas my mother celebrated before she died, Kathy, Kai, and I went to visit. We flew from Sacramento up to Seattle on Christmas Day morning because I work Christmas Eve. So we we flew bright and early Christmas Day, got to Seattle Airport, rented a car, drove two more hours, got to my parents' house in Burlington. Mom was too ill to cook Christmas dinner. The Sorensen Christmas dinner had been the same and will be the same for generations to come. It is prime rib and Yorkshire pudding and Gulliver's cream corn and baked stuffed potatoes and a few veggies that might change, but that's about it. Dad had purchased all the food necessary and I was to cook upon my arrival because the Sorensen tradition of Christmas meal would be the same even if mom was unable to cook and wasn't healthy enough to do that. But... Since I was going to cook things and I decided that I had to make the prime rib the way I make it and not how mom had been preparing it for decade after decade after decade. You see, I make a paste with garlic and rosemary and olive oil and salt and pepper and I smear that paste all over the meat. Well, when I told mom that I'm not cooking it at 325 for 18 to 20 minutes a pound, which mom had been doing forever and ever and ever, I says, no, because I don't have time to do the the slow cook method, I'll do the very high heat method, because you can cook a prime rib at about 500 degrees for 45 minutes and then let it rest. It is amazing. But this is how I prepared prime rib. And let me tell you what my mother did. She let me cook the prime rib my way, her Christmas dinner in her kitchen, cooking it in a way she never imagined or never heard of, using rosemary, an herb that even though she had an extensive spice rack, was not present in her kitchen. And it never occurred to me, never occurred to me at the time what a generous act of love my mom was providing to me to allow me to cook her prime rib not her way. See, without even realizing, I was insisting on my own way. St. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, love does not insist on its own way, right? My mother's deep and unyielding love for me was right there. and She did not insist on her own way. Rather, the love of family, the love of being one as a family was more important Families and churches and people of faith can be, come be divided over stuff much less important than a rib roast recipe. Let me tell you, I've seen it. But on that Christmas day, what I didn't even recognize at the time, but I experienced again, was the love of Christ through the love of my mother. Who placed her love for me over her right, if you will, and even her own authority. That's what it is. How do we live as one? Well, we we give up a little bit. You see, so I've gone from mergers and acquisitions to unity churches dividing to a Sorensen family Christmas dinner, all under this theme of e pluribus unum, out of many one. You see, God's love for us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is so complete, and it is so all-embracing that it loves us even when we insist on our own way. And loves us enough to recognize that our way really isn't all that important. What is important is how well we do as Jesus has prayed for us. That we be one, not for oneness sake. But that we be one so that the world may know that Jesus has come. And that Jesus loves us. That's what we witness to. That's the mission and purpose of the church. Not to get what we want and need so that the world may come to know the God who loves them. May we live into this glorious prayer of Jesus for us.
He is risen. He is risen Amen. Rooted in the abundant life and love of Jesus Christ, we pray for the life of the church, the lives of people in need, and the life of all creation. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, today we hear you pray for us. You pray that God will protect us, and you pray that your people will be one, so that the world may know your love through us. May that oneness and unity, gifted to us as the body of Christ, become ever more real to us as we are discipled to work together in your name. Hear us, O God. Declare your righteousness through the blossoming of creation, by the winds blowing and the birds singing. Inspire us to join in the hymn of creation. Hear us, O God. Be the source of all strength and peace for people who are imprisoned. Renew them with the overwhelming power of your salvation and give them release for their spirits. Hear us, O God. Reveal yourself to those who feel isolated because of illness, grief, status, or the prejudice of others. Especially we pray for Alfred, Rhonda, Dagny, Suk, Shirley, Lowell, Vern, Stanley, James, Norma, Ramona, Don. Comfort and welcome them into your spirit-filled community. Hear us, O oh God. Bless those who serve in a mothering role for others. Send your spirit to those who mourn, those who have not known their mothers, or those who long to be a mother. Hear us, O oh God. You draw all saints into your presence. Draw us into the mystery and wonder of your presence until Christ comes again. Hear us, O oh God. Worship at Bethel comes to you from downtown Madison, Wisconsin, every Sunday at this time. We invite you to join us in person for worship. We gather for many different and unique services, including traditional, contemporary, festive, informal, family-oriented, Spanish, and Bhutanese. This program is funded entirely by viewer contributions. You may joyfully support us by means of electronic payments by visiting our online giving section of our website, where we have several payment options available. If you would like to contribute by writing, send your gifts to Media Ministry, 312 Wisconsin Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53703. For more information about our ministries or how to sponsor a broadcast, please call us at 608-257-3577 or by visiting our website at www.bethel-madison.org where you'll find streaming versions of Worship at Bethel and information about our varied and exciting programs. Thank you for your continued support and join us next week for Worship at Bethel.